This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast covering all things entertainment and existential. Today we're talking about sports fandom. What's the deal? How do sports differ culturally from other kinds of entertainment? My name is Mark Linsenmeyer, third grade champion of the flexed arm hang. Wasn't that for girls? <laughs> Weren't Shut boys up. supposed to do the pull-ups? <laughs> we did both. I got to just hang there. <laughs> I'm Erica Spires, and I set the record for discus when I was in eighth grade and then never did as well as that again my freshman year of high school and uh, failed to show up for the pictures in the yearbook and nobody noticed. That was a long one, but I feel like it was worth it somehow. I'm Brian Hurt and I have a body built for watching baseball. (laughs) And our special guest today... I'm Dave Revson. I'm the lead studio host of the Big Ten Network and author of a book on the history of college football, the opening kickoff, the tumultuous birth of a football nation. I, I mean, along the lines of what you guys are talking about, uh, I played college basketball in oh. Ireland oh. for Trinity College Dublin. And uh, I like to brag that every one of our games was standing room only because there were no seats in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That is a good place to start. So were you particularly, how did you get so super interested? I know, so we were in plays together in high school. Right. We, we've gotten another person from the high school Brian and I go to. In fact, we just, in our last episode, did Christmas movies and had to comment that. So every time a Christmas story plays, I at least have to comment, oh yeah, I played a variation off of one of those characters in an unrelated short story by Gene Shepard. Yes, Lost at Sea. Stick with you that you still identify yourself as Schwartz whenever that movie comes up? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I still contend that that was the best theater production that I was ever in. We were really, really good. We were in competitive theater, which yes. is kind of a novel concept to me. I still think we kind of got robbed at the tournament. I felt like we were better than whatever it was that Pekin High School did, which was kind of morose and depressing. Yes, that was some sort of a cultural thing about how that particular group interpretation event was taken around the state by different judges. That it seems like different people in different parts of the state had different conceptions of even what that thing was and how to be successful at it. Right, but theirs were wrong and ours were right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now, Dave, I'm surprised that you were able to do both drama and sports in high school. No, I need you to understand the reason I joke about the basketball team is because like, we literally would have lost to our high school team. I always find that really interesting that college athletics, of course, is such a big deal in the United States. And you say, I played college basketball and people are like, well, you must be good. In the rest of the world, I mean, we're the anomaly. In the rest of the world, you just kind of, well, there's 14 guys in the school who are interested in basketball. They'll be the team. And you just we had a tryout. I mean, I think they cut a few people who maybe had never played. But for all intents and purposes, if you had ever played the game, you could have been on the college team. And I think that's what's so fascinating. And, and that's a lot of what my book is about, actually, is kind of how did this idea of college athletics grow up in the United States? Why did it happen here and nowhere else in the world? No, I was not a particularly good athlete in high school. My soccer career, such as it was, ended sophomore year. And then that was it. I kind of gravitated toward doing theater and uh, radio and television and all that kind of stuff. And athletics for me are... You know, something I kind of do on the side. I like to run and play golf, and but not a great athlete. Brian, I think you suggested this topic. Why don't you kind of start us off? Sure. Well, I think as we were finding the boundaries of what pretty much pop is and isn't as a podcast, you maybe just threw out, Mark, once this idea of whether sports is even part of something that we cover. Because we do a lot of TV and movies, and as it happens, music based on your interest, Mark and Erica. And we've gotten into comedy and into other things. And it just strikes me that sports is really a pretty big part of what we do in our free time, certainly consuming sports as fans. And I think there will be a lot of listeners who maybe aren't sports fans who, nevertheless, sports is part of their experience, even if avoiding sports is part of their experience. Or if consuming sports just as a, a secondhand consumer, right? It's on because their family members or their friends watch it or because the only way, you know, the office is going out afterwards to a game. Well, 
I don't really want to go to the game, but I want to spend time with my friends or my coworkers or whatever at the game or at the sports bar or your team in your town is in the world series. And that's great. And if you want to have any conversation, you at least kind of have to know about it, or you might really get excited about it because even though you wouldn't normally follow this year, the nationals, if you live in DC, it's impossible not to get excited about that when that's going on. So I thought it would be interesting to have a discussion at least about how sports intersects society for either the non-sports fan or the casual sports fan and how the sports fans and non-sports fans interact with each other around sports. I think this would be a good time for us to plant our flag in the ground and say where we stand on this. I definitely follow sports. There are a few I don't, but largely I do. And I'm more a baseball fan than anything else. But I'll watch pretty much anything that's on. If I'm just looking for downtime or if I need something on in the background, I'll usually put on a sports network before anything else. Erica, what about you? My dad was always active and always had us playing sports as kids. So it's something I grew up with. But once it came time for me to decide between what I was going to get scholarships in, I dropped the sports, knowing that I really needed to focus my energy where I actually had more talent. Then I just kind of quit watching. You know, I was really into basketball and it was a great time to be into basketball. I was, you know, into it at the beginning of like the WNBA and when Jordan, you know, had made his return. And But I haven't watched, honestly, and followed anything since, except that now my husband is a huge soccer fan. And so we watch it every single weekend. And I really passively watch it. But at least like I, I know who some of the players are. I kind of know what's going on a little bit in the soccer world, but that's about it. Mark, I, I'll answer for you, Mark. Mark is what you'd call a super fan. <laughs> a super fan of watching my children play their sports. <laughs> that is about it. There are other things that I you know, have ventured into based on family members watching you know, the Olympics or whatever. It was even hard for me. Brian found these articles which were really interesting. You know, the Washington Post did a whole series on fandom, but like I open an article and as soon as I see somebody in New Jersey, I like start to scroll past it. Like as if <laughs> this is just something that arbitrarily early on, based on not being good at sports as a kid or being made fun of, like not identifying with the sports crowd in school, that I just put a line in the sand and like there's so many things I'm interested in that I just have to sort of arbitrarily say, I guess, you know, this is a whole world I'm kind of glad that I'm not sucked into because that would be so much more stuff that I would have to be obsessed about and have to, you know, know everything about in the way that I am a sports fan about musicians. You know, what producer was on what out. There's all these other areas that I act like a fan in that way. I don't think there's a good reason for it. So I was very interested in having this discussion to kind of explore what the hell is wrong with me or whether there's any justification. Yeah, Dave, I know that. So you do this professionally. Is there any kind of like, and you were excited enough about it. Nobody forced you to write that book. So you obviously have some interest, but is your interest confined to college football? Or are you more widely a sports fan or tell us about your background? It has become probably more focused on college sports as lots of other stuff has entered into my life, particularly family. I just think that the level of obsession that I had as a sports fan of kind of needing to watch every significant game has definitely decreased as I've, again, just kind of become more involved in going to my kids' sporting events or going out to dinner with my family or spending time with my wife or whatever it is. So I think my sports fandom has evolved. It started very young. Uh, There's a family story of my father was a huge sports fan. Uh, We actually lived in Madison, interestingly enough, uh, for a year. He was a visiting professor at the University of Wisconsin. And my mom went out on Sunday, and that was the one day a week where there was a hockey game on TV. And so my dad was a Blackhawks fan and it may have even been the Hawks that were televised that day. I I don't really remember, but you know, he basically kind of complained to her, why won't you take him with you? He's going to ruin my ability to watch this hockey game. And then she tells the story of coming home and we were arguing about whether or not it was offside. So I kind of got into it really quickly. It was a way to connect with my dad, who uh, was a business school professor, but in his leisure time, he really enjoyed sports. He particularly enjoyed college sports. And so we moved back to Chicago. He was a professor at Northwestern and we would go to Northwestern games and, and they were literally at that point, it was, they were the worst team in the history of college football, not just the worst team at that moment, but they lost 34 games in a row and we were season ticket holders through this. And so this was kind of a bonding of misery together. He was a Bears fan. They were bad. They got good at, you know, after a little while, maybe 10 years later. 
So all these teams were bad and we would just kind of watch these games together and suffer together. And, and that was our, our bond. And so I just kind of got into it. I enjoyed playing sports. I was never great. Uh, There were some sports I was slightly above average at and many that I was below average at, but I liked it. And it fed into kind of my nerdiness of wanting to know everything and memorizing facts and information and knowing everything that was going on. So yeah, I be, I became a fan really quickly. It was kind of a golden age of announcers in Chicago, of sportscasters, you know, from Harry Carey to Jack Brickhouse to Pat Foley doing the Blackhawks, which he still does. I mean, it was, and then the local sportscasters were great too. I mean, Tim Weigel and Johnny Morris. I mean, he's Jack Topic. These people were kind of big stars. So because I was somewhat talented in that area. I enjoyed communicating and theater and that kind of stuff. I think I thought that that was a good outlet for me. I, I realized I probably would never play in any kind of a meaningful game, but this was a chance to be involved in it. So I kind of gravitated toward that area. And I was a sportscaster at ESPN eventually for 11 years where you kind of need to know about everything. And I mean, you're at the epicenter of sports. I hosted Sports Center, which is the definitive program on everything that's going on in the sports world. You know, I need to know what was happening in NASCAR, which I'm totally uninterested in, but I needed to know. And I ended up hosting two World Cups. I really didn't know anything about soccer, even though that was probably the sport I'd, I'd played the best as a kid. But somehow I got tapped to be the studio host for the 1998 World Cup. And I mean, it was a crash course to figure out what was going on. That must be terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that no, was a little scary, especially because of the names. As you know, I mean, the names are, are crazy, Erica. And so yeah. you need to know what club they're associated with, right? So they play for the Dutch national team, but maybe they, they play in Italy's Serie A. And so you kind of had to know about that. It's just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was voluminous information. But anyway, so when I left ESPN and went to the Big Ten Network, I, I really... I've kind of minimized some of my other sports viewing. I mean, I spend 17 hours a day on Saturday talking about and watching college football. And then when the NFL's on Sunday, I kind of say, you know what? I'd rather be with my family. I'll, I'll watch a highlight show at the end of the night or I'll read about it. Or sometimes I'll find out on Monday what happened. And it's just not as big a deal to me as it used to be. So now I think I'm interested in what I'm interested in. But some of the other stuff that I used to be passionate about, I'm not as into. Dave, can I ask if learning about the other sports that you had to cover made you more interested in them? Was there any kind of genuine connection you made when you you kind of learn how to watch a NASCAR game? <laughs> game. You learn how to watch a NASCAR <laughs> race by, by learning how to cover it, right? And there are strategy you're, you're not really aware of until you get in the weeds and maybe you become interested and maybe you just cover it because you cover it. Well, I would say the auto racing is the extreme example. I mean, I literally was never interested in it. I could not see the appeal of it. I did begin to understand a little bit of kind of what was going on, but, uh, but it didn't do anything for me. I would say the same thing about boxing. I genuinely do not like boxing. I just kind of find it to be barbaric, frankly. And there are a couple times where you find yourself in a situation where you have to cover it. And, and again, just totally uninterested. It is a job like any other job where you've got to, whatever the example would be, I need to put together this spreadsheet or I actually worked on Wall Street for one year as a financial analyst for Chase right out of uh, after I came back from Ireland. And I, sometimes I liken auto racing or boxing to that where I had to do a spreadsheet analysis of some company that I couldn't possibly care less about. So I would say like the World Cup is the greatest sporting event, I think. It's very exciting. Oh, it's incredible. And, And it's so tied up in the things that I really am interested in, which is kind of the intersection of sports and society. And why are people passionate about it? And where does nationalism come into play? And this idea of connecting sports brings people together in a way that very few things do and kind of gets you in this mindset where you're all aligned in in a world where people are so, especially now, more and more fractured than they've ever been. And everyone has their own area of interest. And it's very contentious politically and whatnot. Sports, I think, have this ability that I would contend nothing else has to bring people from very disparate backgrounds and different identities together around a common cause. And, And the World Cup is the greatest example of that that there is. Yeah, I loved covering the soccer. I felt like I was pretty knowledgeable by the end and, and knew a lot about it and understood the dynamics of it. So I just think it kind of depends on on the sport. There are things I'm interested in. There are things I'm not. But you do, as you learn more about it, perhaps some of the stuff that, that may have seen arcane to you all of a sudden makes sense. Obviously, the world's changing a lot. And one of the examples 
you know, it's in popular culture all over the place is that nerds are now cool, right? When I was growing up, I think when most people alive have grown up as sports are the people who do sports are the cool guys and the people who do everything else are not. And I think that that's changing in so many ways. And there was a time where I felt like the cool kid playing the sports. And then when I didn't, I felt out of the loop. Now I've gotten to a place where I love when I, I coach theater and the kids that I get that have played sports, I love coaching. I've just found so many similarities. It's working together as a team. It's kind of like running where you're running your own race. You're running to beat your own thing. But like, it's not a competition in the same way that some people think of theater. Because if you're doing it that way, then it, it takes the joy out of it. People who played sports understand how to take direction and criticism in a way that is really healthy. I just find it to be a super useful tool all over the place now in a, in a way that I hope that there continues to be a trend that we encourage kids to do sports now that a lot of kids are playing video games and not getting up off of the couch as much. I hope we continue to encourage them to do it because I think it does teach us a lot of great lessons. So I think, Erica, you're bringing competition as the differing factor between coaching a theater. You know, two activities that sound like they could be pretty similar is right at the crux of it. You know, even now playing sports or watching, like, if somebody really wants to bring the ball down there, shouldn't you help them out? Why would you purposefully stop them from doing that? <laughs> like, there's something just counterintuitive about competition as a way of life. But obviously, that's what the drama is, right? That's the appeal. That's the drama, exactly. Like, I, I had a friend who who said to me, "I don't think of it when I go out on on the stage anymore. I do think of it like you would think of sports. Yeah, you technically know what's supposed to happen." but you don't know how you're going to get there to the end result. And you have somebody that's, there's a conflict of interest. You have your objective and then you have somebody trying to stop you from doing that. I just find it to be a really helpful analysis now. Now that I feel like there's not that disparity in my head of like, oh, I can't be into sports because I'm into the arts. You know, one thing that you said that I think is interesting too, Erica, where you said that the nerds are cool now that certainly is the case in sports. I mean, part of what has evolved in sports fandom is this whole notion of analytics and of looking at sports differently. I mean, you have general managers of teams who have literally never played at any kind of high-end competitive level, and that didn't used to be what it was. I mean, it used to be former players and, and people who knew the sport from playing it. And now there's this whole idea of analytics, of kind of mathematical analysis of you know, the money ball approach to sports. And, and so that has changed things dramatically and, and has given rise to this whole subsection of people who in some ways dictate the transactional moves of these franchises who have no ability to do what it is that they're talking. You know, they're not baseball players, but because they have discover these different ways of looking at and analyzing the sports, they become really powerful people in that world. What you were just talking about with yourself going to school for, what did you end up majoring in? History. Oh, in history, but then you worked on Wall Street. Yeah, it's weird. I guess I just assumed that you were, you know, in business in the, somehow, but you, like you're obviously a really smart guy or else you wouldn't be able to hold all of that in your head and make sense of it when you're on the spot trying to handle all of that information coming at you. Well, I would not overassume any intelligence. It's okay. I can yet. say I can <laughs> say it for you. You know, I always say that being a sportscaster is not exactly brain surgery. So, but yeah, I mean, but you know, look, it's probably most comparable to what you do, Erica. It's kind of this spur of the moment. It's adjusting. There's a lot of improv to it because you're talking to other people who are experts, and so you're kind of reacting to what they say and taking all the the knowledge and information that you have and figuring out ways to get get us from point A to point B. So. For me, the similarities are the performance part of it more than anything. And it just happens to be in an area that I'm really interested in. I think one more intersection between sports and nerd culture, and boy, there really are a lot of them, is this idea of fantasy sports, right? And there's sort of this joke about these sports fans who are making fun of Dungeons and Dragons players who are pouring over their little character sheets and their stats and their numbers. And then they go to their next table in the cafeteria and they get out their fantasy sports <laughs> teams and you know, the quarterbacks and the running backs and the fractions of points that they're going to get for this game or that game. And really it's a very similar type of thing with these characters who you own, who do their thing and you, do well or you do poorly. And I, I know there's money involved sometimes, or maybe there's just bragging rights, whatever it is. But it's another way to participate more broadly to consume sports without actually 
being an athlete or being active yourself. And I, I think that and then the recent legalization of gambling on sports nationwide is really going to be even driving up that kind of participation further. I mean, it's a bit of the Wild West right now. I don't know if everyone is following what's happening with sports gambling, but getting to the point where you could be at a game with your phone out and, and really gambling on the next play or who's going to score next or what's going to happen. And it's just going to completely change the way people interact with a sporting event, whether they're there or watching from home. Brian, I do not think you can overstate what you just talked about. The importance of fantasy sports and gambling and the popularity of sports is immense. And as one who has never really participated in either one, very tangentially in some fantasy sports, I don't gamble at all, but I become acutely aware. It's impossible not to be aware of the influence that gambling has on my industry. And it's really evolved. And when I was at ESPN, we literally were prohibited from talking about the gambling lines. And now in this about a decade plus since I left, maybe 12 years, I mean, they have entire shows that are premised around it. They have the bottom line has the gambling lines on. I mean, everything about it. We finally acknowledge that a huge part of the reason that people are consuming their product is because they're gambling on it. And fantasy sports allows you, as you said, it becomes very social because it can be this is my office pool. These are the people who live on my block, whatever it is. This is my family. We have this fantasy sports competition. I think it's a huge part of the popularity of the NFL. I don't think you can overstate how important it is. Why are people obsessed with the NFL? I think football lends itself to television and it happens on the weekend. But you'd be foolish if you didn't include fantasy sports towards the very top, fantasy football toward the very top of why people are into watching the NFL in the way that they are. I think it is immense in terms of driving the popularity of the sport. Let me ask you this, Dave, because there's one thing I, I haven't quite figured out about fantasy sports, and that is, well, and for people who aren't really aware, the idea is you own various players for a given week or for a season, and you get points based on how they do individually. Do fantasy sports participants, do they even know who won a game necessarily? I mean, the thing that I sit down to watch sports on a weekend. I watched an NFL game last night. We're recording this on a Monday. I was watching to see who would win. Is it possible that these people who participate don't really even know how teams are doing or, or they don't care? Or are they really just having their little fantasy team that they're running and trying to win or lose on? Man, that's a good question. I, I don't know. As one who doesn't participate in fantasy sports, I, I guess I'm not really totally qualified to answer. I've never asked that question of people, but I would have to believe to a certain extent that's true. Or even if, if they might know who won, but they don't care who won, because what's more important to them is whether or not their running back got to the threshold that earns them a certain number of points or whatever it might be versus whether or not his team won. So I do think there has to be something to that. Uh, you know, it's funny, you guys sent out a bunch of articles kind of in anticipation of this conversation. And and there was one which kind of put forth the notion that a lot of sports are boring. And, and I think to a certain extent, that is true if you don't have some sort of vested interest in them. And what fantasy sports do is it allows somebody who lives in Chicago to have an interest in a game between Cleveland and Houston or whatever it is. Even though you don't care about Cleveland and Houston, you care about these players who are on your team. I think it's part of the way and gambling is the same thing. You know, I know people who are gamblers who say, I can't watch a game unless I have money on the game. And implicit in that is the idea that I don't really care about the game that much. Like, I don't find the game in and of itself that compelling. And I think a lot of regular season sports are that way. I mean, there are a lot of games, right? There's 162 baseball games. There's more than 80 pro basketball and hockey games in a year. So what makes game number 37 interesting to you? Part of it might be gambling. And I think for a lot of people that that overrides it and it allows them to give themselves a justification for why they're sitting in front of the television and taking whatever it is, two to four hours to watch the sporting event. That's so funny, David. It really points out to me why I'm such a bad gambler, because I don't really enjoy it. And my mother lives in Las Vegas, and I'll go visit her, and I'll occasionally put money on a game, and I get so nervous that I can't watch the game. <laughs> and it completely is the opposite of what you're describing, because clearly I just don't have the, 
the Constitution to be a gambler. I just like I want to know if I won or lost when it's over. <laughs> I get nervous enough already. It's like, yeah, this isn't for me. So the fundamental criticism of non-sports fans of like why you'd be so interested in sports is, isn't there some kind of weird identification going on? It's like, oh, we won. You didn't win. You're just sitting there. They won. Those athletic people there. So clearly there has to be what the non-sports fan who would be voicing that objection is not getting is something about the identification. And there was another article that actually that whole Washington Post series, the one that you pointed us to, Brian, why do we care about sports so much? They did a whole series in 2016 during March Madness. One was by an economics professor. One was by a psychologist. And one of them brought up when you're watching something, you're identifying, you know, this is the same appreciating theater or something. You're identifying with what the character is going through. And so that's why, you know, when you're focused on the players, and I totally get this when I'm watching my son's team or something, like I feel viscerally, you know, identifying with him and with them and not the other team. You know, if someone on the other team does a really athletic, awesome thing, like I might have a little appreciation for that. I'll still clap because you're supposed to, but like mostly it's, ah, you know, so I, I do get it how these things work, but there's still sort of the, I don't know, what, what do you guys think about this? Uh, I kind of want to separate out the different things. Like you can really just appreciate athletic prowess. Would you have the same effect if it was just, they were doing something that's purely luck based? You know, every country, this is a sort of a bogus philosophical thought experiment here. Every country comes up with a team and then they meet for an Olympics type event and it's just like coin flipping. <laughs> but they do it in a way that it's dragged out for a couple hours and you, there's, you know, some Las Vegas style, but there's no skill of them involved. Would you still identify with those people, you know, from your country that are doing the coin flipping and could get as excited about that if it was, you know, theatrically staged enough. Let's say it's a candy land. No, no, no. Shoots and ladders, which is a coin flip. I, I think people would root for Team USA on shoots and ladders. Absolutely, I do. When I'm watching a game, if there's a really exciting play that the opposing team does, I will have that moment of appreciation for sure. But I don't think I have that gut wrenching investment. That's a different level of emotion that I'm feeling for my own team when I'm rooting for them. I remember getting sick, like feeling sick when I was probably in elementary school, watching my brothers play basketball and just like high school teams and like high school rivalries, right? And when we felt like something bad happened to one of our guys. And I think that's one of the reasons I ended up distancing myself from sports later is I was like, why am I getting so invested in this? And Mark, you, you talked about this, but if I could just read the quote from this article the leading hypothesis by psychologists, I believe it's Robert Cialdini, is that our brains get confused about whether achievements or characteristics belong to the body it inhabits or to another person. It's even beyond talking about our team. You know, people can identify with teams across the country, places they've never been to. My husband's a huge fan of Bayern Munich. His family way back when was from somewhere in Germany. But it's not like he's directly German right now. It's not like he speaks fluent German. And yet, when they win, he's like, yeah, we won today. And I'm like, it's so weird to me. So I suppose there's something else even deeper than it's your home country. It's, it's something you've chosen to put your stock into. Yeah, I think this is really interesting, Erica. And this is something that I wrote quite a bit about is kind of this notion of the way that we identify with whoever it is we're rooting for athletically. And I think this is part of what makes college sports really interesting is because in college sports, you do have a shared experience, presumably if it's your alma mater. Sure. Yeah. Right. Like, hey, these guys, I went to Wisconsin and now these guys are going to class in the same buildings that I went to. And we have this connection and we all have these songs that bring us together. Right. We have the fight song and we have the alma mater and all of these things create this collective experience. And in the case of a university team, you made a conscious choice. You decided that was where you were going to go to school versus, well, I happen to live in Cincinnati, and so I'm going to root for the Bengals or whoever it is. Here it's, no, this is where I chose to go. And there's something different about us at Wisconsin versus those guys at Minnesota. And so it becomes this rivalry. And there are no more intense rivalries, I would suggest, than in college sports. I do think there are a few in professional sports which approach it, and maybe the Red Sox against 
the Yankees. I know that there are many of them in, in international soccer as well. But to me, the greatest rivalries are in college sports. And I think the reason that the rivalries are so intense in college sports is because there's a different level of identification with college sports than, than I believe there are in professional sports. And again, it's driven by this collective experience and this connection. You feel like you and the guy who is playing quarterback have something in common. And in college sports, I think in particular, you root for nostalgia. There's a nostalgic component where you think about the time that you spent there, theoretically at least for a lot of people, that was a really happy time. You're a teenager. You're away from home for the first time. You meet these friends who become lifelong friends. There's this whole experience of those four years that stay with you, unlike any other four-year period in most people's lives. And the manifestation of that for a lot of people is, is these athletic teams. So, so it is this notion of, yeah, it's the quarterback who's making this play, but I'm part of that. I have this connection there because I went to Wisconsin, too. And I'm probably still paying for Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> there is a vested interest. And Dave, other than maybe the coaches, it's a little different with between college and the pros that you don't have these players who hang around a very long time, right? You have this kind of constant churn and people necessarily go because they graduate or go to the pros or do whatever. But that one thing that's eternal is the team, right? And it's not like your franchise is going to pick up and move cities or something, right? Your right. college is going to be where your college is. I'll tell you, I've spent the last 20 years in Lincoln, Nebraska. There are a lot of people in that town who didn't go to the University of Nebraska who are nevertheless rabid Nebraska Cornhusker fans. It really, it's a bit of a different thing, but I, I still think that it feels very much like the loyalty is like a pro team. It's, I want to say the sometimes irrational hopefulness, the irrational despair, all the irrational emotions you feel with sports are there just as much for a, or it can be for a college team and a pro team. There's, they seem more similar than different to me, having been in Nebraska for so long. And, and maybe it's different in other places or places where you're rooting for your lovable loser college team in a way that if it were your pro team, you just wouldn't pay attention until they were doing better. I happen to, because Nebraska is now in the Big Ten, I happen to spend a lot of time there too. And I would agree there are a lot of people who did not go to these universities who root for them. And Nebraska is a great example. The University of Iowa is the same way in the Big Ten because they are the only teams in those states. And so they are kind of, it's about state pride. And the fact that Nebraska, which to most people, in the United States, just population wise, because so few people live in Nebraska, it's not a place that they think a whole lot about. It's flyover country, right? Between the East Coast and the West Coast. And yet Nebraska, for those who don't know, I mean, in the mid nineties, they were the best college football team in the country. And some might argue that we're the best college football teams in the history of the sport. And you literally Memorial Stadium in Lincoln holds when it sells out, it becomes the third largest concentration of people in the state You have Omaha, you have Lincoln, and then Memorial Stadium would be the third largest city in all of Nebraska. So you have this place that's kind of sparsely populated, that this team is the way that they show the rest of the country that they matter. And again, I would say the same thing is, is the case at Iowa, uh, the same thing at the University of Connecticut. I live there because that's where ESPN is headquartered. Their basketball team, right? They don't have a professional sports team. They're nestled there between Boston and New York and kind of divided on what they root for. But man, when UConn basketball and UConn women's basketball are good, it gives Connecticut something that, that it can rally around. I agree with that suggestion. No doubt, Brian, that, that it's not just about having gone there, but it's also, hey, we matter. We're important. And again, the fact that these are state universities, that it's the name of your state that you live in that is on that television set that people are watching. I do think that that gives people a, a source of pride. So since you've been there, Dave, you've seen the stadium and that big giant N on the side. You know what that stands for, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you're going to say knowledge. That's for right? knowledge. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. Anything that you're you're talking about is when you come from a place that doesn't have a lot around, you do tend to get really excited by what you produce if it's something that's great. I remember there was a story that came, I'm, I'm from Southern Missouri, and there was a story that came out about a very, very small town. By very small, I mean under a thousand. And I want to say it was like sometime in the 70s or 80s, this, this basketball team came 
out of there. And they were all these guys who were like farm kids. They were huge farm kids. They happened to be good at basketball. They ended up winning the state championship that year. And people who didn't train for this their whole lives, they just happened to have some aptitude for it. And they worked together. And it didn't matter at that point, me hearing the story, knowing that this team at this point, you know, when I was growing up, may have been a rivalry, but to think back that like they could have done that with so few resources is really exciting. And then even in professional sports, you have one thing that I think is neat about international soccer is that you have these youth teams. And when a youth player comes up through the academy and ends up playing for their team, there is, I think, a, a greater feeling of, of ownership and pride in that. Like we produced that person from the ground up. And it's sad when those people leave, but it's great when they stay the course through their whole careers. So it's not just your feeling ownership and identifying with a place, because clearly there are times even with your alma mater where you are keeping track of who's actually on the team and how they're doing. And maybe some of it has to do with just if they're doing really well that season, you might pay more attention or just depending on what's going on in your life. Brian had sent out some articles on human interest stories in the Olympics and trying to sell people like it's not just that. You know, I want to watch this because I appreciate seeing people doing impressive physical things. It's because there's a story. It's because I know who these people are. So I, I guess I also want to ask this to, just to Dave that you're getting familiar as a broadcaster with it's not just the super famous, super successful teams, but you're getting, you know, a really familiar picture with the operations of so many different teams. Does that make you feel sort of more attached to all of them? You know, it's just like, I know who the kids on my son's volleyball team are. And so obviously I'm going to feel much stronger than these kids that I'm seeing for the first time. Yeah. And I think the human interest story is a big part of it too. Certainly with what we do, Mark, I mean, we try to drive those stories. There seems to be a lot of times a correlation between kids who come up in very difficult circumstances who see sports as a way out. And so there are a lot of incredibly compelling stories in sports, kids who have overcome tragic circumstances to become very successful. And we, as a means of trying to get people to watch, will broadcast those stories and we'll, we'll try to get into the background of them a little bit. You might, as you head to break, say, hey, an amazing story about this particular player when we come back and then, you know, part of your preparation for the game would be talking to that player and finding out more. And maybe, maybe you'd have a story of their family. We have a very successful show on BTN called The Journey, where it's kind of behind the scenes with each of these players and incredible stories. I mean, as a kid who's playing for Minnesota this year, he's a four time cancer survivor and went from being a really great high school football player to you know, fighting for his life. And now he's like their third string holder on place kicks because he's gone through all these cancer treatments and that's kind of essentially what he can do at this point. But man, when he came in and held for an extra point in a game earlier this year for the first time after surviving cancer four times, that's an amazing story. And people gravitate toward that kind of stuff as well. They should. It's remarkable what he had been through to get to that point. And so I do think there are a lot of compelling human interest stories in sports and stories of perseverance. And all of those things resonate because I, I do think that you all, everyone kind of looks at the circumstances or the challenges that they've been through in their lives or, or maybe that they haven't been through challenges like that and that they still sometimes struggle day to day and to see people who have overcome these incredible odds. So that is a big part of it. I mean, that, that was hammered home to me definitely when I was at ESPN. I mean, we were all about storytelling and it's kind of one of the things I felt like I've tried to bring to BTN as well. And, and we have a lot of other people who came from a, a similar background is tell these stories and get people to understand how amazing these people who are participating in these sporting events are above and beyond just their ability to put a ball through a basket or run a long way with a football without other people bringing them to the ground. So I, I don't know. I do think that is a, a big part of it. I think there's just a human drama to it, whether it's, the greatness of somebody, their kind of supreme talent, or whether it is the circumstances that they come from, that ropes people in. People are are interested in that. I definitely am. That's one of the reasons I love the Olympics. You know, it got me watching events I would never have any real interest in unless I knew the story behind the person who was doing it. The Olympics are the ultimate example of that kind of storytelling on television. 
where they will spend two or three minutes introducing you to someone who's the great biathlete or whatever it is. Then you watch them compete. They do such a good job of kind of as a production of roping you in and making you care. Because, yes, I mean, other than there are some sports, particularly for an American audience, right? I mean, I suppose there's at least a small sliver of people who care about hockey. And Mark, you would know this. I suppose Brian would too. The town that we grew up in has a tradition of great speed skaters. Called itself the speed skating capital of the world, just because there was a speed skating club in Northbrook, Illinois, that produced these Olympians. There's a guy in my class who was an Olympic speed skater who was in for several years. And then I had a fraternity brother in college who was in a bunch of Olympics. And I went and watched him compete in the Olympics in France in 1992 in Albertville. I would never watch speed skating. Who cares? But in the Olympics, think about, for those who are old enough to remember, what Bonnie Blair meant to America, what Eric Hyden meant to America. I mean, these people are competing in a sport that literally, virtually nobody cares about for 365 days a year for three years in any calendar cycle. And yet in that fourth year, everyone is talking about it. And that is all about storytelling and all of those different elements that we've been talking about, kind of coalescing and coming together and creating a great story. I feel like, especially with the tape delay that goes on with some Olympics, depending on where they're being played versus you know our time zone, sometimes you get this excess of storytelling versus actual athletics. Really, for me, it was the Sochi Olympics where we would have, here's some storytelling and here's a commercial and here's two minutes of an event. And we're going to come back to the event and now 45 minutes have passed. We're going to cut out a big part of it. This seemed a bit much. And I think these most recent Winter Olympics, which it was one where streaming had really come into its own. And I was watching these events just through the app. And I would sit down and I would just watch a two hour cross country biathlon event. Just, you know, watch the women go on their little timed starts and they'd go and they'd ski and they'd shoot and there would really be commentary, but there wouldn't be any of the other things. And it was really sort of glorious just to watch a pure event from beginning to end without the commercials, without the nonsense. And, and there's a place for it. And it's good to have context. But man, there is a wrong way to do it as well. And I'm glad <laughs> that that's available to us, that we can actually now see these full events in a way that I feel like when you are just a slave to television, that's the only way you can consume that product. Well, I just think you'd be in the minority, Brian, in terms of people who would really want to watch the entire hurdling match. But I do think that the ability to stream and the ability to have simultaneous broadcast going on relatively inexpensively, which is that, I mean, that's a huge advance mm -hmm. in, in the business that I'm in. It allows you to say, OK, for the people who see the Olympics as a television program more than anything, and that's kind of what it is in a lot of ways for most people. And, and again, for those who are competing, it's obviously something very different. It's kind of the culmination of these years and years of training and a chance to compete with the very best in the world and all of those different things. And I'm not minimizing that in any way, but it is essentially a made for television event in this day and age. And so for those people who are very casual fans, that's the way most want to consume it. But I think the beauty now of, of all this different technology is that there are different ways to consume the same event. So yeah. So for the person who is genuinely interested in the entire curling match, Without Mike Tarico's flowery introduction, and you know Mike's a great friend of mine and someone I, I admire greatly, but I get it. Some people don't want to watch the, the studio component of it. They just want to watch the game. And it's not to pick on the Olympics, because if you look at the Super Bowl, that's what a lot of people consider to be the you know this ultimate sporting contest in America between the two best pro football teams. But leading up to the game is 12 hours of human interest stories on the channel that's airing it and other sports channels. And then when it finally airs, right, it's a four-hour game. And football isn't a four-hour game, but it's because of all these commercials that people are tuning in. They want to watch that. And this halftime extravaganza that's way longer than normal halftime because you have to trot out a celebrity performers and a big stage and elephants and whatever else. So the football is a pretty small part of the Super Bowl when it's all said and done. And Joe Buck, I heard, who, as an announcer, he has commented that it's actually the easiest game to call because you know all these stories and you can talk at length about anything during downtime. It's preseason football that is hard because 
you don't know half these people and you barely know how to say their names and you can't say anything about them. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just got back from the Big Ten Championship football game and we did a two and a half hour pregame show on Saturday from Indianapolis. And then we were on the air for probably two hours after the game. So if you put all that together, we spent more time doing pregame and postgame than the actual game took. So, and of course, that's nothing compared to the Super Bowl. I mean, to your point, it's crazy, Brian. I mean, the amount of coverage. And I think it just kind of is is feeding into it. It speaks to, we wouldn't be doing it if people didn't want to consume it. We're not doing this just because we feel like we need something to occupy our first Saturday in December. We're doing it because people watch and people are, for whatever reason, drawn into these games. They enjoy the storytelling. They enjoy the analysis. They enjoy all those different things. And maybe it's just part of the anticipation of watching the game that you kind of you want to extend the experience because you're looking forward to it so much. Maybe you genuinely do find the the broadcast compelling, the the pregame and the postgame shows. I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, my job is not to analyze why people watch. It's, it's simply to provide that content. But it is really interesting how big games do become about so much more than the game. Well, you do, or at least your producers have to think about what's the ideal story presentation? What is the length? One of my best recent sports experiences was my daughter was in the cast of the school play, which was called Girls on the Boat, and it was about the women's Olympic rowing team. How it started, it was like the whole history of it, you know, with Title IX being introduced and and the struggles they had to go through and not having the same facilities that the boys did. And and even the characters didn't even have names. They were kind of like stand-ins for maybe real people, but, you know, definitely the same actresses were playing somebody that was there in 1973 and then somebody was there in 1989, although making it clear, obviously the team is changing. But like that was such a compelling story of, you know, what became one of the most winning teams in all of sports history that I knew nothing about. It's a sport that I just wouldn't have been interested in at all. And now, you know, they gave enough of like the difficulty and the calluses you get on your hands and things, you know, the drama of doing that and the evolution of that team. That's a presentation of that that didn't even involve watching the sport directly at all. And yet I feel like, you know, so I think the same goes for sports movies. Like I think a lot of people who don't like actual sports, one of the articles we looked at said like, oh, if every sport were presented like any given Sunday, then I would like them. I tend to actually still avoid sports movies for the same reason I avoid real sports. So I haven't made that complete connection. But to me, 12 hours of pregame before the Super Bowl seems a bit much. Does it really just depend on sort of your level of fandom in terms of what is going to constitute the best presentation of story for you? Yeah, I mean, having never been involved in the presentation of the Super Bowl, I, I'd be out over my skis here. I'm not sure I can kind of speak to how they produce it. And I have to be honest with you, I don't think I've watched more than an hour's worth of Super Bowl pregame shows in probably seven or eight years. I mean, I just I watch the game. We have a big gathering in our neighborhood. And so I go and hang out with my buddies. I, I'm kind of in hibernation during football and basketball season. I tend to be very, very busy doing my job. And so for me, it's a, it's somewhat of a social. It's weird because I'm someone who is obviously does make their living in sports. and But I'm not as compelled to watch the game because it's my opportunity to hang out with my friends, who many of whom I haven't seen for several months. I mean, I can just kind of speak to for our games and our pregame. I mean, you kind of try to find a mix of for the hardcore fan, you want to have enough so they don't say, well, this is just fluff. I don't need this. And we spent a lot of time on X's and O's on Saturday and, and had uh, former coaches and former players. We had a demo field of, hey, here's something you need to watch, how Ohio State's going to counter it. Uh, but we also had human interest stories, interviewing former players. And so you just kind of try to find that mix of what people find compelling and try to split that difference. I think if you're going to get into sports movies, too, and actually sports conversation in general, I'm surprised we haven't hit more on the fact that we basically could also do this podcast on dads and relationships with our dads, right? I think <laughs> like good relationships or bad relationships, I feel like most sports movies somehow have, have something to do with it. I guess Field of Dreams is one that I'm really thinking of, right? Yeah. But yeah, that's why like I have still any like love for sports is... Luckily, I got time with my dad outside of sports. He was a music teacher as well. But I remember on snowy days, somehow he was friends with everybody at the local school. So he had keys to everything. 
And we'd go into the gymnasium and just shoot hoops for a snowy afternoon. It was so much fun. Or he'd take us and play tennis and we were terrible at it, but he took time with us. And for me, it was something special. And I know that it links to a lot of people with their dads, whether or not those are good memories or tough memories. My kids are going to have mom memories like that because she was the, the big athlete. I love that. Even through college, doing volleyball and things would take both my son and my daughter various times to UW volleyball games or whatever. So those are going to be uh, special memories with them where I was like, here, let's play guitar. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And of course, that'll happen more now. Like since, uh, you know, post Title IX, we are going to have more like of those stories are going to be moms. But don't you think kind of at, at the core of all this, Erica, whether or not it's with your mom or your dad or community or your friends or your neighborhood or whatever it is, I mean, I think kind of part of what we're speaking to is that sports bring people together. Yes. And again, I mean, there are lots of other things that bring people together, too. I'm, I'm not arguing any kind of exclusivity, but they bring people together in small groups for participatory reasons that you're talking about. Go shoot hoops with your kids, go bowling, whatever it might be. It, it's an activity that you can do together. And then spectator sports bring people together more broadly. We're sitting in front of a television with your friends or your family. And I think that's a huge part of it. It is a common experience that people who are doing all kinds of different things during the course of any ordinary day or, or during the week or, or whose lives may never intersect, this brings them together. And it brings them together in small groups and in large groups. And I think that's a huge part of its appeal. Absolutely. And, you know, at its core, it's not about politics or religion. So it's something you can talk about. There's the great scene in City Slickers where Billy Crystal's character is talking about how he fought with his dad all the time. But the one thing they could actually talk about was baseball. That was their one common ground. And I always think about that when I think about how sports unify people, whether it be in the family or whether it be more broadly. Because, yeah, we're as fractured as we've ever been as a society, and yet people who ordinarily wouldn't associate with one another and maybe don't even know like kind of what the other person's viewpoints are on all kinds of things that might be important to them. They're able to not even talk about it. It's not even an issue because they all root for whatever team it is. Well, we should wrap up. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. This was super fun. We could definitely do many more hours <laughs> chasing down these leads, but let's call yeah. it a day. Really a pleasure to be on with you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Erica. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for joining us. This was great. Bye, everybody. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.